Good morning, evening, or afternoon, and welcome to Classically Trained Nerds Book Review. Have you ever imagined that you were in a fantasy book, and in that fantasy book was an epic battle? There's thousands upon thousands of creatures, orcs, I mean, various types of enemies. There's epic music happening in the background. You got your sword and your shield and you're pumped up. And there's only 10 of you guys versus the thousands of them. And you think to yourself, man, if only I had a gun right now, the carnage I could reap. Well, good news, because Django Wexler has written a flintlock fantasy where that sort of actually happens. It's a book called The Thousand Names, and it is fantastic. So if you've never heard of a flintlock fantasy, let me educate you real quick. So it's a standard fantasy novel, but instead of like swords, shields, and axes, they use flintlock musket guns and large cannons. Think Napoleonic Lord of the Rings. Or better yet, think Wheel of Time series, but set in the American Revolution. So Django Wexler has written four books in this series so far. The first one, which is what we're reviewing today, is called The Thousand Names. The second one is Shadow Throne. The third one is The Price of Valor. And the fourth one, which was just written in this August, is called The Guns of Empire. So one of the great things about this book is the characters. So there are three main characters. There's Winter, who is a woman who disguises herself as a man to join the army. And then she finally finds herself getting promoted and has a lot more responsibility than she thought she would. There's Marcus, who is the commander of a garrison that is reserved for people who are in trouble or people who they just want to get out of the way. Winter is part of Marcus's garrison since she kind of wanted to be in the middle of nowhere. And then there's Janus. Janus is a strategic genius and all around like the really smart guy of the book who comes in to lead the garrison and to solve a huge problem that's happening in this little continent area of Candor, it's called. And he is uh, kind of, you know, think Tony Stark, but a little bit more light from the Death Note series, if you've read that. Uh, kind of that like mysterious intelligence and not very outspoken, but outspoken to the certain people that are around him. Very, very great character development in this book. Probably one of the best that I've read in quite a while. So Django Wexler does an amazing job at character development in this book. It's probably some of the best that I've read and I wish that he would hold workshops with some other writers to really develop their characters as well. So let me give you a quick rundown. A little spoilery, but not too much. It won't take away from the book at all. So there's Winter, who is an orphan who runs away from the orphanage because the orphanage is trying to sell off women. There's Marcus, who is suffering from PTSD from a traumatic event and is also he's a, actually a really nice guy and actually probably one of the better characters in the book. Janus, well, uh, he's a mystery. So we don't really know a whole lot about him and that isn't done by accident, it is on purpose. Django Wexler does a really good job at keeping him a, a mystery. Like you don't really know what his intentions are and he both wrecks and saves the day in the end. Again, I won't spoil it too much but uh, you'll really like the ending of the book. It definitely caps things off, and Janus does have a huge part in that. So the world building is phenomenal in this book. So, you know, between the demonic possession magic system, the great political issues that are happening in this world, and even a fanatic religious organization, there really is something for everyone in this book. If you like romances, there's a nice hidden romantic plot. If you enjoy them political intrigue, there's tons of it. And if you enjoy just good old bloody carnage, there's plenty of that too. So their magic system was pretty cool. Something a little different than some of the other systems that I've read in other books. The way their magic works is via demonic possession. Now, it's not really touched upon a whole lot in the first book but I believe it's going to be more prevalent in the second and third. Now, the magic system really doesn't get explained until the end of the book, so I don't want to get too, too much into it as it might spoil some of the intrigue and some of the buildup. But it is very unique and it does beg to be discussed, so I'd like to talk about it for those who have read the book in the comments below. So Wexler creates this great world 
and he maintains it very well from chapter to chapter. You know, it expands at an appropriate rate, so nothing is too rushed, nothing is thrown at you so fast that you can't understand it or you don't know where it comes from. And, you know, he has a great way of using dialogue as an expander of his world. So instead of really describing everything, he lets characters tell you what's going on. Now, he doesn't go too far with it either that I've read in some other authors. You know, everything is where it should be. So a huge part of this book is the warfare tactics. Now, if you ever read a warfare history novel, then you know how dry it could be. But Wexler somehow, and I really don't know how it happens, but he adds a lot of intrigue in this warfare. You know, it, it isn't dry at all. I straight up could not stop reading when the battles were happening. If somebody had interrupted me during the book while I was reading that, I probably would have had a panic attack. Luckily, that didn't happen. Now, if you are into historical military novels or military tradition, then this book will be in your top 10, no doubt about that. So not to spoil it, but just to give you kind of an idea of what I'm talking about. In one of the battles, the army is outnumbered like a, to a 10 to one ratio, and the enemy is running at them, and the characters load up cannons, like super large naval cannons, with shotgun shells, basically. Big ones, big, huge ones. And there must be like 100 cannons versus like 50,000 soldiers. And as the soldiers come, they get to the point blank range and the cannons go off. Now, the description that Wexler writes in the book is so vivid and so perfect that if they were to make a movie out of it, they couldn't even show it on HBO. So I'm gonna give this book a very, very solid nine out of 10. It could be a 10 if I heard more about the magic system up until about the end of the book. So I do wish there was also some more character development behind some of the minor characters like Fitz or Commander Give Him Hell, and that is his name in the book. But I do believe there's gonna be more of that in the coming books, so stay tuned on that. Now my favorite part of the review is what Hollywood actor would play these characters if this was made into a movie. Now the character of Winter, I would say should be played by Charlize Theron on two counts. First, I think Charlize Theron could play a girl playing or acting to be a man, not because she's manly in any sort of way, but she has definitely a little bit more aggression to her and she kind of has that sort of suave manliness to her. I don't know, it just sounds good in my head and I think it would be a great fit. Also, I think Charlie Theron definitely has the acting ability to really, really touch on the deep, deep emotional issues that Winter has. So as for the character of Marcus, I definitely think that Colin Farrell should be playing him. I think the descriptions are very similar they're kind of young, but not too young, kind of mid-30s. They're, uh, you know, very deep, deep people. They're quiet. They're, you know, I've seen Colin Farrell play similar roles. And I think, you know, Marcus, as with a lot of other characters in Django Wexler's novel, are deeply emotionally pained. You know, there is some issues that have happened in the past. Marcus has kind of a PTSD issue going on. And I think Colin Farrell can really, really pull that out of the character and really create a more dynamic acting and more dynamic movie from this character. Definitely a good pin on that. Uh, let me know if you agree with me or not. Then there's Janus. Janus, I think, should be played by Joseph Gordon-Levitt under the sheer fact that their descriptions are very similar. They're both kind of lanky, intelligent people. And Joseph Gordon-Levitt, like, you know, I love, he's one of my favorite actors, and I just love throwing him into anything, really, in my head. You know, if I'm gonna envision some sort of book or novel as a movie, he's gonna have some involvement in there. He's, he's just, he's an awesome dude. 
And, you know, be, besides that point, I think he really does fit the description of Janus quite well. You know, like I said in the book, he's kind of a lanky, intelligent type. He's very uh, into being polite and he knows a bunch of languages and he seems to be able to have the right idea at the right moments. And I think Joseph Gordon-Levitt can really pull that out. So one other thing about Django Wexler's writing, which you don't really know until you start reading the second book, which I just started. Now, he really builds up the second book without you ever even noticing it. So like I've said before about his political intrigue and how he kind of de draws and develops that in the chapters, but what you don't really know is he's actually building the second book in the first book, which is just impressive, impressive writing. And I think once you skip over to the Shadow Throne, you'll really see the just, you know, how phenomenal of a writer this man is. And I'm intrigued to see how the second one, or even the first one, also builds into the third one. I know he must have this whole storyline created beforehand in order to kind of draw in, you know, certain visions and certain imagery from book one into book two, and then hopefully from book two into book three. Uh, I know some writers write the book one and then they'll start book two. Uh, and I think Django does a really good job at, at you know, he has a whole plan. He's got a, a certain steps that he's going by and he's sticking to it. And it, like I said, it's just a really good way of showing how awesome he is. Thanks guys for watching Classically Trained Nerds book review of A Thousand Names by Django Wexler. If you enjoyed it, please like and subscribe. It does help the channel out greatly. You can also follow me on Facebook and on Twitter. I'll post the handles below. Now, if you feel inclined to purchase this book, I will post the link to the Audible and the paperback version on Amazon in the description below as well. And thank you for hanging out with me and I hope you have a good morning, evening, or afternoon.